thank you for joining Wars of the Roses. And the following video is going to be discussing Cain and Abel and also Seth. Taken from the Student's Monthly Letter by Madley P. Hall, June 1937. Cain and Abel. In the first verse of the fourth chapter of Genesis, Eve says, I have gotten a man from the Lord. The ancient Jewish mysteries declare this to mean that Cain was the child not of Adam, but of the archangel Samuel, the serpent, the mysterious luminous power at the root of all human perplexity. In the authorized version, the translation is so obscure that both Adam and the Lord are referred to as the fathers of Cain. But the early rabbis knew their scripture better than 17th century theologians, and the old commentaries insist that Cain was the son of Samuel and Abel was the son of Adam. Cain was therefore the embodiment of cosmic fire, and Abel the son of the agrarian principle. It was for this reason the Kassadin explained that the offering of Cain was not acceptable to the Lord, leading to the first crime, the murder of Abel. That this story also relates to the mystery rituals is evident from the words of Voltaire that the Samothracian mysteries were the account of a brother slain by his brethren. Early efforts were also made to identify the drama of Osiris and Typhon with the Abel Cain story. The murder of Abel is one of the most difficult of the allegories to interpret, but in substance the story is as follows. If we understand Adam to be man, the incarnating ego, the one father of all the bodies that are manifested by an entity during its life cycle, we realize that by the fall as described the descent of this egoic vortex into the sphere of generation. It first produces phantom forms in the astral light, a progeny of demons by Lilith as explained in the ancient commentaries. Later by union with the human principle, Eve, it begins the generation of bodies, this mystery cunningly concealed under the genealogy or the descent of the patriarchs. In the process of generation, polarity must first be established. In the Chinese cosmogony, which by esoteric interpretation is also anthropology, the creation arises from the endless striving of two principles, termed yin and yang. In the Greek system, Ether and chaos are the polarities from the mingling of which the cosmos is fashioned. As the physical universe is engendered from the opposing of polarized forces, in like manner the soul arises from the strivings of the polarized will and by an alchemy within the consciousness itself. Jacob Bema, the German theosopher, depicts this striving within the self by a series of symbolic figures showing the eternal battle between light and darkness, between action and inertia, wisdom and ignorance, etc. Later Johann Jettel illustrated Bema's principles with a series of curious engravings, now extremely rare, but the best mystical key ever prepared for the interpretation of the scriptures. Cain and Abel represent the first discord or confusion arising in the superphysical organism of man. It is evident that the allegory has universal application, or it would not be part of the mystery rituals of many ancient orders. Furthermore, it is a known fact that all these rituals relate to the unfolding of the human soul. So Cain and Abel must be some part of the consciousness of man. Bema creates the terms divine will and self-will, with which to designate the two parts of man's consciousness, which are ever in a state of mutual striving. The allegory of Lucifer in his battle with Michael the Archangel has similar interpretation, the war in heaven being merely the conflict with the soul or superior nature as contrasted to the body which is the earthly nature. It is evident that in this allegory Cain represents self-will or the active principle and his descendants become builders of cities or bodies and workers in metals, the sense perceptions. Tubal Cain, described in Genesis 4.22 and who later occurs prominently in the Masonic allegory, first pounded swords into plowshares. Here he represents self-discipline as an aspect of self-will 
by which the destructive emotions are reframed and tempered. The descendants of Cain were all wanderers and artisans and of the race of builders, and in the 23rd verse of chapter 4, it seems that the crime of Cain is repeated by Lamech, his descendant. A study of this chapter will show that in the cycle of the patriarchs, the principle of recapitulation is ever-present. In the same way, Noah is a second Adam. This is explained by the Chinese who declare that the cycle of existence is represented by the zodiac. At the end of each great age of manifestation, the universe is dissolved in the sign of Pisces, or the Deluge and is reformed or reborn in Eris. Eris is the sign representing Adam. Taurus is Eve. Cain and Abel are the twins or Gemini. The eternal principle is reborn at the beginning of each cycle, even as it is stated definitely in Genesis that Adam was not the first man, but merely the first man of the cycle or an incarnation of the eternal man, the protogenes of Plato. In Genesis 1.28, the law, Lord, said to Adam, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth. This is exactly the same thought expressed in the ancient Confucian metaphysics. All creation is a replenishment in space, a new manifestation of eternally existing principles. If we realize that the signs of the Zodiac are the Patriarchs, even as later they are the Prophets and the Apostles, we shall perceive that creation, so-called, is the movement of the ego or consciousness, whether microcosmic or macrocosmic, through the twelve signs or parts of the solar year. This solar year is the Manvantara of the Hindus, the day of Brahma the flowing of the great breath. This breath is also mentioned in Genesis 2-7, where the law, or Lord, breathed into the nostrils of Adam the breath of life. There is so much commentary material in the Zohar, the Hebrew book of splendors, concerning the significance of the great breath, but only a suggestion is possible in the space at our disposal. If then Cain and Abel are the light and dark halves of the human will, born like Castor and Pollux from the single golden egg, the ego, we can understand why the Greeks symbolized the soul as a sphere made up of a gold and a silver hemisphere joined together. We know that in the ancient mystery temples certain disciplines were given for the perfection of the human soul. The ancient wisdom was disseminated through the East and the Near East by means of ritualistic dramas called the Mysteries. Lao Tzu, the Chinese sage, as librarian of the Shu dynasty, read the ancient books brought to China from India. We are told also that Osiris, the great leader of the Egyptian faith, was brought from India in the form of a golden bull. This again, a reference to the secret doctrine, having been brought from Asia and circulated through Mesopotamia and the Mediterranean civilizations. Eastern metaphysics and the Jewish religion is Asiatic and are based largely on the glorification of the passive principle. In the Hindu books, we learn of the sage who, by sitting quietly under a tree, discovered by inward contemplation what all the strivings of the outer life could not attain. Lao Tzu taught the sovereign dignity of doing nothing. You have to do nothing very intelligently and profoundly, however. It is not superficial laziness that is a spiritual virtue, but rather a perfectly enlightened inward tranquility that can come only with the mastery of all external forces and circumstances. Abel in the allegory, brings his offering, the firstlings of his flock, and offer them to the law. By these are meant the animal propensities of his own nature, such as always the meaning of the burnt offering referred to in the scriptures. Because he brings the animal, his offering is accepted. Cain, on the other hand, brings the fruit of the ground, and that is not accepted. The fruits here represent not principles of the soul, but merely consequences of action. 
Cain's offering represents the same type of superficial gift that the rich man gives when he presents a stained glass window to the church but continues to cheat the widows and orphans. Cain gives of what he has, for fruits represent accumulation or possessions, but Abel gives of what he is, the firstlings, his transmuted animal nature. Cain, incensed, slays his brother, reminding us of the words of the Indian classic. The mind is the slayer of the real. Thus, the allegory has an eternal significance. It is the very key to the whole mystery religion. It is the very reason why most faiths are today empty of esoteric wisdom. It is the key to that ceremonialism of the superficial life which obscures the inward perceptions and brings creeds down to a useless war of sects and bigotries. Seth in the Patriarchal Line The fifth chapter of Genesis is devoted to the genealogy of the patriarchs from Adam to Noah. It will be observed that in this chapter there is no mention of either Cain or Abel. Seth therefore is established as the founder of the races of the earth, begotten in the image of Adam his father even as in turn Adam was begotten in the image of the Lord, the creative hierarchy. Much has been made by biblical students of the extraordinary length of life attributed to the patriarchs. In chapter 5 verse 5, Adam's age is given 930 years, and in verse 27, Methuselah is recorded as living 969 years. It should be understood that these numbers are Kabbalistic and refer not to the span of the individuals, but the duration of families, clans, and blood records. Also in the Jewish system of metaphysics, each of the numbers is symbolic of certain Hebrew letters. These letters form words according to the ancient hieroglyphic system attributed to Moses. The proper decipherment of these symbolic ages reveals the astronomical and cosmological import of the patriarchs and their lives. Realizing that Adam is not an individual but the human life wave, it follows that his children and their children until the tenth generation are the branchings and forkings of the racial tree, also the differentiations of the cyclical currents by which the life of man and the life of the world are sustained. This explanation solves such problems as arises in Genesis 4.15, where the wife of Cain is mentioned, yet the scriptural accounts infer that at that time Cain and Abel were the only progeny of Adam, supposedly the only man in the world. Also in the same verse, Cain builds a city which he names after his son. One man could scarcely build a city, nor could the abode of one man be termed a city. But when we realize that Cain is a race, we then understand that the story of his wanderings is an account of racial migration. By Seth is to be understood a new generation, one which takes the place of the earlier creation that had failed and destroyed itself. An account of this earlier race is to be discovered in both Chaldean and Chinese writings. The historian Berrios describes the monsters that were formed in the primordial Illus, the slime board, the monsters with many heads, a strange order of prehistoric composita which vanished away in the dawn of time. In the Gnostic remains it is described that the Demiurgus, or creative power, fashioned innumerable bodies while experimenting with the cosmic substances. Most of these bodies were incapable of containing a mind. They were the nightborn, the false birth, the monsters of the abyss. This account is based upon the Hermetic legend, wherein it is described that these first creatures were destroyed by the gods because they could not be vehicles or bodies for the incarnation of intellectual entities. Of such an order also are the giant kings of Edom, who perished in the void. Also, these are the Shaddai, the antediluvial kings recorded in the Zohar, the third of the children of Adam. Seth is the third race known in the occult tradition as the Lemurian. It was in the later subraces of the Lemurian race that the human being we know as man was differentiated from the animal prototype. Thus, in Lemuria, 
the true man came into being, man having been formed as the vehicle for the thinker, we have the explanation for the opening verses of chapter 6. The first verse describes that man began to multiply on the earth, and in the second verse it explains that the sons of God, or the intellectual egos or conscious entities, gazed upon the bodies that had been formed, or the daughters of men, and took wives from among them, i.e. joined with them to become the true humanity that we know. Thus Seth is the physical archetype of man, even as Adam is the spiritual archetype of man. Sincerely yours, Manly P. Hall. Thank you for watching. Please don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and comment. And if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Roses. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description below. Thank you very much.